everybody, welcome to this episode of Trade Talks Podcast hosted on the Glass Guys YouTube channel. We have a very special guest, local entrepreneur, um, professional, former professional athlete, still in really good shape, uh, Mr. Ryan Veshi from Matterhorn Fit. Welcome, sir. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Yes. Appreciate so. it. I think I'll, I'll start with, uh, we just did a remodel at our place and uh, my architectural glass came in and did a phenomenal job uh everything you say on social no bullshit this was a great great job on time looks phenomenal we're getting tons of compliments on it so thank you to you guys appreciate it that is a massive well, review holy shit we will be clipping the shit out of that <laughs> um and we appreciate the business and um why don't you tell us a little bit let's get into that first what is matterhorn fit yeah matterhorn fit is a, a advanced neurological rehabilitation and performance center um, we treat all musculoskeletal injuries from a neurological level, so different than traditional PT. And we look at specifically how the brain communicates with the body so those parts of the body can contract to absorb the force of movement. And um, we then seamlessly integrate that into a personal training program to prevent, to re reinforce those connections and prevent the problem from coming back. And so we launched in 2018 in Bonita Springs. Uh, soon we're forced to open our second location, um, in, in 2021. Uh, so that was in Naples, Florida. And now recently we launched our franchise system to bring our process, uh, across the country. So pretty excited about where we're at, our growth. And, uh, we feel like the Matterhorn method and our process, which we'll, we'll get into is, uh, something that is turning a lot of heads and, and outperforming, uh, other types of therapy in the industry. So. I love, 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 because Jay and I have been on this neurological kick of, through our cells, the emotional intelligence. But when I met you, actually, you reached out to me, which that's another aspect of cold calling. I actually had a, a nagging injury in my shoulder. And when I went up there, they kind of did this, like, uh, assessment test. And so when he says neurological, they're hooking up electricity, uh, low volt. Uh, you'll get into that. But needless to say you quickly find out that the brain is not talking to certain parts of your body quickly. And I had never experienced anything like this. It was very eye-opening. Yeah, and I think that's what, you know, a lot of people come in, you know, our biggest goal is to get people in for that initial evaluation because once they experience that, yeah, then they really start to understand and buy into the process because it is different. It does work quickly. Um, we look at it from a different perspective than other people do. And really this... We were, was founded by myself and Sean Sullivan, who is a strength coach for professional athletes. Back in 2013, after my back surgery uh, and hip surgery, I had two of which were back to back, six, six months apart from each other. I thought I was going to retire. We started combining all these neurological techniques from these different practitioners that I met through my professional hockey career in Europe and put it into one systematic integrative process with his strength and conditioning. And it unlocked all my compensation patterns. I ended up playing for another five years pain-free. And when I retired, we said, let's see if this could work for other people or if this was just simply an anomaly for my, uh, for my own body. And so we set out to test this on you know, other athletes, in particular other pro athletes, and then active individuals in Florida, in particular the active senior population, as we know, which is uh, you know, a large population down here with the hypothesis that if – we could help these people, we'd have a very successful business that was making a big impact. And fortunate enough, it did work. And now we have this uh, really unique Matterhorn method that is, uh, you know, hopefully we're going to um, take to help as many people as possible. That's awesome. Let's let's back it up a little bit. So you, you went to an Ivy League school in Cornell. And what did you go for? Was it business? Was, yeah. it, was that your initial goal? Like if yeah. If hockey didn't work out, that's what you were going to do. Yeah, my dad was an entrepreneur. Uh, he started his own business out of our basement in you know, 1985, and he grew it. They were operating in 13 states in London when he, when he sold his company. It was a staffing service company as well as he created a, a software vendor management system. So uh, after seeing him do that you know, and not knowing what I really wanted to do uh, other than try to use hockey to get into the best school I could, um, you know, fortunately, Fortunately enough for me, I was able to go to Cornell and, you know, got a business degree just to keep my options open and really try to, um, you know, figure out what I wanted to do, knowing that really I wanted to be a hockey player and play professionally for as 
you know, even one year or as long as I possibly could. And so back in my mind, as I was playing, it was always, you know, there was always an entrepreneurial bug in me and just, uh, you know, thinking about starting uh, something after I was done playing. So was it a scholarship to Cornell or are you walk on? No, Cornell doesn't give scholarships. Uh, Ivy League schools don't give athletic scholarships. So um, it's one of the rules of the they Ivy League. They can't afford it? Yeah, I don't know what the deal, <laughs> what the the deal is. They need to change that. So <laughs> yeah. They totally handicap. I thought these schools were endowments as it was. Yeah. I mean, what's going on They here? totally handicap the athletic programs <laughs> wow. with that rule. But, uh, <laughs> you know, so they only give, you know, financial aid, but they recruit, you know, and you just have to be recruited. I was recruited to go there. Um, had some scholarship offers from other schools. Um, came down to... You know, Harvard, Yale, and Cornell were my final three choices. I ended up feeling that Cornell was just a better fit uh, for me from the campus. The rink is unbelievable. If anyone's been up to Lina Arena, it's one of the most uh, rowdy college hockey crowds in the country, uh, arguably the, the best rink to play in in the country from a fan basis and involvement. It seats about 4,000 people. The It's a horseshoe, and all the way around the horseshoe, they stand the whole game. So no one sits down. They have all these chants. The Cornell pep band is, like, renowned for being, you know, one of the best pep bands in college hockey. So it was just a great atmosphere. I loved every minute of it, loved the school. The friendships and the network from that school have been uh, invaluable to me just personally and, and professionally. So. And you're still in touch with a lot of the folks from Cornell? Yeah, we, just, we, went, we were ranked number one my junior year. We went to the Frozen Four. They just did a 20-year reunion for us last year, so we got, like, the whole team came back. It was awesome. We haven't seen a lot of those guys. We all talk on text, but just to get together again and, you know, walk the campus. and That's cool. You know, it's fun. It's nostalgic. Yeah. And then how did it go from college hockey? You got your degree. Yeah, so I graduated 2004. Uh, it was the lockout year in the NHL, so it was very hard to get into the American Hockey League at that time, especially myself. I'm five foot, you know, I say eight, but not five foot seven and you know, 165 pounds, so it was difficult to get in. So I had an option to play in the East Coast Hockey League or go to Europe. Decided to go to Europe uh, and keep developing, uh, especially my skating, just try to keep getting better, bigger ice surface over there. And so went to Sweden, had a really good year, and then came back and played in Springfield, oh Mass, in the American League my first year uh, in the American League. So that was the following year after that. Your first year in the American League, you played – for the Springfield Falcons. For the Falcons. So just a little side note, Jay and I's relationship over 25 years ago started at a Falcons game because right when my father retired from being in the AHL, he became an entrepreneur. And I think he wouldn't say this, but I think he still wanted to be relevant in the hockey world. So his first piece of advertising that he did was on the dasher boards at the yeah. Springfield. Yeah. It was Indians, but then Falcons. And so they had season tickets. And Jason also had season tickets, and that's where we met. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, there's a lot of history there in Springfield we with lost, hockey. Yeah, that first year in the American I think we lost like 16 games in a row, and uh, we were coming off the ice. The fans were ruthless to even their own team. You know, <laughs> yeah. like you, It's more passion. We were, it's passion. We were coming out into the tunnel, and the guy would just be waiting there. The, the whole arena left. It'd be like guys waiting there just, just to tell us, you guys suck, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, thanks. <laughs> but, yeah. So you – Obviously, you you got into the AHL, yeah. Um, made it up to the NHL. Now, what I think a lot of people don't realize is hockey is probably, if not the hardest, one of the hardest sports to actually make it to the top. Um, I read a statistic that less than 0.1 percent of North American organized hockey players actually make it to the NHL. Yeah. So here you are, an undrafted free agent. Go over and play one year in Europe, come yeah. to the AHL, do pretty well in the AHL, and you, you finally get called up yes. to the NHL. So it was a little, my row was a little even longer than that. So I went to the American League in Springfield, had a really good year there, signed an NHL deal the next year with Ottawa, uh, was in the minors in the American League the whole year after that, had an okay year there, and then went back to Europe, went to Finland. And then came back under a San Jose contract, um, and I made it with San Jose that next year. I played ten games the first year, and then I got nine the the second year. But I was there. But in the show, in the show, oh, yeah, fuck, you were there. Yeah, oh my there. god, I, mean, I got chills just thinking. That's about everything. It. I mean, it was great. I mean, my first NHL game was in Long Island, so they called me up. They got to give you know, general manager was um, you know phenomenal to like give me the opportunity to get called up for the first game that year in Long Island. I scored my first goal. I was playing on a line with uh, Joe Thornton and Danny Heatley. 
and uh, he scored, you know, the first shift. They put me on the line with them. I stayed there for a couple games. I had a, a pretty good little stretch. I had next night was in the garden. I scored in the garden. You know, third game we were in uh, Tampa. I scored in Tampa. So I had three and three, you know, sell the car, honey. I'm not coming home. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, like here's the know, next Wayne Gretzky. But, uh, you know, I hurt my knee. We're in Atlanta. Um, had an assist in that game, but then hurt my knee, and I was out for a month and a half. And then guys came back from injury, and that was it. I was back down the minors and then kind of up and down. So, that was kind of the the short window, and it's funny how things can happen and things can change. But um, you know that opportunity got me the the job in Russia, which was uh, you know the second best league in the world in the KHL. And I don't think without those games or without the stats, I would be able to um, even be looked at for that league. What and do you so, What do you mean in Russia? How does one even go about playing over there? Yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the imports over there are NHL players, right? Like so, they're like. You know, are they scouting you? Like, are they headhunting to bring you over there? Gener or? Generally, your agent will start talking to them, and teams will look at the stats, talk to the Russian players in the league. We had Evgeny Nabokov, goalie, um, on our team, and, um, you know, he told me later on he was getting calls about me because I guess my agent was putting things out there, think, trying to get to Russia. And, um, yeah, so he vouched for me. He's like, oh, this guy can play. Like, he's just been kind of in the minors, like leading, leading the team in scoring, but he, he can play. Like, and so ended up getting a shot there had a really good year there and I ended up playing six years in that league and um you know some wild experience you know just playing outside the U.S. in particular inside of Russia and wild uh, experiences uh, yeah, they were uh you know it's a different world there right like you have a different why don't you pull the curtain back for us a little bit <laughs> yeah well you know we have a I mean I have a lot of stories about Russia I think I can really get into kind of some of them but the uh overall just in general they the lifestyle, the way the teams operate, it's very militant. Um, they have sometimes with teams, they have what's called a baza, which is like they're afraid of the Russian guys going out and drinking, you know, in between games and, and, and getting into it. So they would put you all in like uh, army barracks and you got to stay there. So now I, I'm in this city. I got my wife with me who's traveling to Russia. We have a, my daughter with me. And now that after pregame skate, we can't go home. We got to go to this army barrack to take a, a team nap, you know, and have a team meal. And then we go to the rink to play the game. And then we come home for the night. We wake up the next day. We have practice. And then we got to go back to the army barrack and sleep there the night before the next game. And so it was like one of these things that just like made no sense, you know, at all. But it was really very uh, restrictive and, um, you know, things like that. I remember the coach would be asking me, like, we were like, hey, I, I don't want to do the boss anymore. Like, do I have to do the Baza? He's like, you think you can play without the Baza? Play, what is the Baza? Play 29 years without the Baza. You know? What is Baza? Baza means just like, that's what they call the home, like the, the army barracks. barracks, you know? Like, they just call it, you got to go to the Baza. And that was that was kind of the, you know, interesting thing about, about that. But That's interesting. You know. I just saw recently, I don't know, you may have seen it, Wayne Gretzky was on Spitting Chicklets. Yeah. And he was talking about during the Canada Cup, when the Russian team came, a couple of the players came to his house, his, yeah. his parents' house, and he had to sneak them down in the basement because they had KGB following them. So crazy. He had to sneak them down in the basement and feed them beers. Yeah. So when you say militant, they really, I mean, they are protective of their, you hockey know, players in Russia are high-end commodity. Yeah, I mean, they, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the mentality is almost like you're in the military. You know, for these old school like Russian coaches, it's, don't you have to be in the military for some they, of those teams? Yeah, I think they probably were in the military. Probably every every guy probably went through that stint of having to do military service and stuff like that. But right. they just treat it like the schedule is broken down like every hour. It's not like you're a pro and you have time to just like hey handle your business, make sure you're ready to play. That's kind of how it's in North America. Like be a pro if you're not ready. How to do play. you think about it? Is it good? Is it bad? Yeah, I like I like. In North America, guys are pros. Like they should, they get take their rest. They, you know, get their sleep. They eat right, show up at the rink, ready to go. Like they don't need someone saying, "Eat this, do this," you know. <laughs> so it doesn't need to be that way. No, it's yeah. kind of old, very old school, you yeah. know. And so, but we had. I mean, it was kind of crazy, just like the way everything went. The medical system, you know, we had. So, you know, the two lines, you guys did something on the smelling salts, I think, back yes, when, right? Yes, like, yeah, yeah gentry. Smelling salts, so like, the, what is that? What's the deal with that? Just like ammonia, it's, it's like ammonia, basically, like wakes you up or whatever. And guys, guys would use that. But in Russia, the, the doctor, his two like primary sources of treatment were a freeze spray 
which was like to numb anything if you block a shot or whatever. He just comes over and starts spraying you every, everywhere. And Aerosol that, can. Yeah, just like spraying you. <laughs> or the smelling salts. Those were his two lines. And we had a guy, we were on the second period of the game, so the, we had a long change, so we're a long way from the bench. <clears throat> and it was in the cross corner, and our D-man goes in, and he breaks his ankle. And his ankle's like sideways. You can see this from, like the, from the bench. We're like, oh, my God, this is bad. And he's doing the one leg to try to get off the ice all the way from the corner, but it's taking forever. They didn't stop the game for whatever reason. So as he's coming, everyone's yelling, Doc, Doc, like we, we, this guy's going to need help. Like his foot's sideways. And so Doc comes flying down the bench. He's like tripping over everyone, trying to get from one end to the other, the other end. And the guy's got his head down and he's buried and he's holding his ankle and he's just like in pain, excruciating pain. And Doc comes over and he's got the smelling salts in his hand. And he just grabs it and he just rubs it in this guy's Ooh. nose and the guy's eyeballs <laughs> shoot fucking wide open. And he's like, it's my effing ankle. Like, he's telling yeah, the doc this is Russian, gonna make it's, it my, better. it's my ankle. He's pointing, he's yelling at the doc. You know, it, were just, it was just like classic, you know, just classic, you know, medicine, you know, over there. Walk it off, pussy. <laughs> but yeah, rub some dirt on it. I mean, my back went out over there. That's where I had my back surgery, or didn't have my back surgery, but it happened in Russia. And... I lost all function in my right leg. I Holy shit. Like, my foot drop, everything. I couldn't I couldn't even like move. During a game? Uh, it happened in practice and then um the, I played one more practice and it just kept getting worse and worse. And after that practice I literally couldn't move and the coach was like, What the hell happened? Like, how are you out? I'm like, I don't know what's going on. So we go to the doctor, they do some tests, broken English, like I can't don't really understand what's going on. And the doctor says, uh, paralyzation. He tried to trade. He said, paralyzation. And I'm like, what the, you know, so I'm like, call my agent. I'm like, what the hell's going on? You know, like this guy's saying the word paral, you know, paralyzed. So long story short, they stick me in a Russian hospital and this building, I would say is, you know, not only the worst hospital building I've been, it's the worst building in general I've ever been in my life. This looks like it was in the middle of the woods. It looked like an insane asylum. And there was a bathroom in the first floor that was just a hole. It wasn't a, toilet and then so they put me in this there's a woman fully bandaged up in the hallway on a gurney just like moaning like like out of a movie <laughs> so like i'm like oh my god i'm like call my agent i'm like I, i'm not doing surgery here like you have no. to get me out of here you know immediately so i'm in the i'm in the room and it's like kind of deserted it's like this weird like deserted hospital and it was the middle of the night and my leg is like on fire i'm like i need i need some medicine like this is i need someone to help me so there's a button in there and I'm hammering the button like, you know, and, and in, in Russia, they say like, it's not like, excuse me, miss, or they say Divushka and it's, it means girl. So they're like, girl, that's what they like. Yeah. How, they want to order something in the restaurant. They're like, Divushka, you know, they're like, girl, come here. Like, that's how they talk. So I'm like hitting the button. I'm like, Divushka, Divushka. No one's around. There's like no one. So I call my team doctor. I wake him up and I'm like, hey, I need someone to come to my room. I need help. So they send the 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 nurse in so she comes in and she's like oh okay what do you need and uh, the doc tells her like he needs some medicine and they didn't have like normal medicine or anything you could have for like you know something to take the edge off or anything like that so they bring out this glass bottle and she's like um i'm like i need the papers like show me what you're giving me i'm not putting this stuff like in my body and they start like hooking up the iv and they give me the papers, but we're in the middle of the woods and there's no internet service. So like, I can't really translate what this is. So I have a 3G plug in my phone so, or into, into the computer and I, I'm waiting for this thing to like download. So I get finally like a Russian alphabet and I have to like type in the letters, oh my right? God. So now this is going in my arm. I still don't know what it is. Finally, it, it gets to it, it translates. Now I get to a Russian page, I hit the Google Translate, it comes up and Word for word, this is the first sentence. The first sentence that I'm reading on this is, this product has been banned in the United States since 1972. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I'm, like, looking at my arm. I'm looking at the... I'm looking at And they're the, already pumping it in you? It's halfway done. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, shit. Next sentence is, it causes 1% retardation. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my, oh my God. And I, like, I don't even know if I can say that. That was exactly what the translation said. So I'm like, oh, my God. So now, so now I got a decision to make. You know, like, oh, like do, I, do I yank this out of my arm? But the pain's kind of going away. And I'm just like... Friggin Screw it. I'm going to, you know, I'll chance it, Yeah, you know, at this point. So <laughs> still 99%. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's kind of like 
stuff like that, you know, was happening like regularly over there. And, you know, you just did you ever experience this gas? Yeah. What is the gas? Yeah, so the I don't know. How do they but how I, do they administer it? Tell us about this. Yeah, so the the Russian gas and like this is coming from so I've never done a drug in my life, so this is like coming from from me to experience this was like outrageous, right? So we're three oh, what was it? We were a few games before playoffs and the GM comes in and he said that's it, everyone's doing the gas. And we were like just out of a playoff spot my first year in Nizhny Novgorod and so we're like, what do you mean? And the guy's like, oh, all the guys in the team, it's good, it's good, it's good. You're like, you like the gas, it's good. And so we're like, okay, what the hell's the gas? And we walk into the trainer's room, the lights are drawn, it's like dark. Before the game. Now this is like practice, like we practice, then the game's tomorrow, okay? So it's after practice, lights are dark, there's like spa music playing. I'm like, what the hell is going on? And there's this guy in the corner and he's just pumping this thing. He's got this tank and he's like staring at you, just <laughs> pumping this tank. So, so, yeah, the, the guy goes before me, he gets up, he's kind of like loopy. I'm like, what the hell is it? They're, oh, you feel good, legs feel good, legs feel good. The guys are saying, okay, whatever. So we lay down, and this guy grabs this oxygen, you know, mask, and he's pressing on my face with, like, I would call it unnecessary force. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is, like, pressed as hard as you can, and I'm thinking, this is it. This is how I die. The American, <laughs> the American, the American in Russia. This guy is pressing so hard. I'm like, this is it. My body, like, you know, goes numb. You know, and like, I'm like about to pass out. I'm pretty much like passing out. And he's pressing on me, and he pulls it off. And then I'm like out of it. You know, kind of you know loopy or whatever. And so that we, I go to bed. I sleep like a baby. Wake up the next day. I got the worst headache you could ever imagine. <laughs> And this is, you know, I'm I'm having a great year. I'm like fourth in the KHL and goals at the time. Like, I don't want to screw up any of this. Like, I'm coming up a contract. I'm feeling great the way I was playing. I didn't need like, you know, really any help with the gas, right? The next day, like the game comes, I literally was like loopy the whole, you know, obviously no tolerance for this type of stuff, whatever it was. But I was loopy the whole game. My legs felt phenomenal. I got to tell you, my legs felt great. Oh, so they, <laughs> they did feel good. My legs felt great, but my game wasn't really as much legs as it was hockey sense and brain, so it didn't really help me much. Um, so we had to do it every time, and I, it costs a lot of money, and the GM's like, everyone does it. So we leave that game. I'm like, I'm not doing it. And so he's like, you don't want to win? He's like yelling at me, like, you don't want to win. I'm like, oh, I want to win. I just I feel better without it. He's like, you don't want to win. And he keeps like grilling me on it. I'm like, I'm like, dude, I got like 25 goals this year. Like, give it to the guy who's got none right now. Yeah, you know, give like, him mine. You know, like, yeah, <laughs> give him double dose for the guy who needs it. So they thought, obviously, they perceive it as some performance enhancing. Yeah, it's like a, it's it's basically I don't know what it is to be honest. Like, I I think it's like flushing oxygen into the into the body or something like that. Massive I, headache. I believe it's probably not legal is my guess and they're doing something that can't get tested it was like an old russian olympic they called it like the olympic like secret you know like whatever so <laughs> it's weird but you know when that guy had that when he was forcing it on my when he was hammering it down i was like i literally was like this is it i'm done wow this is it this is the end <laughs> of the road this is how i go <laughs> did they give you a hard time when you stopped doing it no i mean it was like that argument and then that was it. I was just like, I don't care. I'm not doing it. You know, putting this in my, like, oh I, don't, my. I don't know what it is. I'm not doing it anymore. Like, I felt I've had a headache for three days. Like, I don't. Out of all uh, the countries that you played in, is, was Russia the only one that was kind of pushing the envelope as far as that type of stuff? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and you know, there wasn't like, I wasn't seeing like guys like doing steroids or anything. It wasn't like anything like that. Like, everything else was pretty normal. And, right, right. And, um, and I don't even know if that was illegal or not. Like, sure. you know, you just don't know what it is. But Still a great fucking story. But it's wild. It was <laughs> yeah. wild. Yeah, it was wild. But I think anyone who's played over there would probably have that, you know, similar experience. Well, I them. played up at UMass in a few practices, and the only guess we were doing were the nitrous balloons out of the, uh, <laughs> out of the dormitories. <laughs> um, well, well, I, I do want to talk, uh, Jay. Bring up that we we want to know your stance on a couple things going on in the NHL. Well, yeah, that was that's I was going to segue into that a little yeah. bit. Um, so I know, growing up, a lot of the, a lot of the different nationalities they, they train differently. Um, for example, here in America, we couldn't hit or take slap shots till peewees. Right. In Canada, they were doing it all along. 
you go to Europe, you, there was none of that. It was all finesse. Yeah. Um, which makes me wonder in the in the KHL was fighting as prevalent as it is here in America? No, but there was uh there was definitely not fighting as prevalent, which is, you know, always a good thing for a guy like me. He was wasn't a big fighter, <laughs> so that's always a good thing. But there was one team called Vitez, and they would bring in their imports were like five of the toughest North American American League fighters. And they had a, a like a tough team, like a real tough team. Like usually there's one guy in the American League on each team. They had five of them as their imports, you know? So like usually they're the skill guys who are coming in as the imports. This team had five and they were just like running around. They were like running around and <laughs> Hanson um, brothers. Yeah. I mean, these guys, these guys are, you know, tough guys. We had uh, one guy was jo John Morasti. His nickname was Nasty Morasti. He's actually got a podcast too, but we saw him in the in the lobby in Russia, and he's like, "This is great that you guys are here. Finally, get to speak English." And we've known everyone kind of knew him from the American League, and you know, guys, some guys play with him or whatever. We're sitting there in the lobby, and he's like, "Yeah, like, you know, that Vess in the American League, I would never, I would never go after a guy like you, but like, the GM here says I'll give you a thousand bucks to take Vessi out tomorrow." Yeah, I have to do it. He's saying it like this, and I'm like, oh, great. I'm thinking oh, wow. like, oh, my God, yeah, great. Oh, yeah, you, yeah, you got to do what you got to do. A little <laughs> you know, bounty like, gate. Like, you know. <laughs> but that's kind of how it was. I think their GM would put some bounties on guys, and they would, uh, you know, obviously do what they had to do. Oh, but, a little you know, bag in a God, locker? Thank God. Thank God I was never on the uh, receiving end of that. But, um, yeah. So that fighting now has been banned in the QMJHL, which okay. is – that's one of the yeah. leading developmental leagues in, in yeah. America. What are your thoughts on that? I think fighting has a place in the game, to be honest. Um, the game is a lot more controlled, and it's very hard for people who don't play to understand this logic. But when fighting is allowed, the game is ple the players please the game, you know. And so when a guy takes a run at someone or hits someone from behind, you know, he's going to have to answer the bell with somebody, right? And so I think that is something that is important in the game of hockey because it controls the game because you can't really run around if you're not going to you know, answer the bell. And if you don't have that fear that you're going to have to f drop the gloves and fight someone, now the game gets more chippy and more more violent you know, than it would be otherwise. Jordan Peterson talks about this, the psychology of it, when you're talking with somebody who's in fit and in shape. like The natural progression of this conversation is we'll debate, we'll argue, but... The severity of the argue is kind of this undertone of like, I better be careful because this guy could beat my fucking ass. Yeah. And eventually we'll get physical. Yeah. And you're right. That does knowing that that option is there. Yeah. In itself polices it. And the layman, I think, would have a hard time understanding that. But it's true. Yeah, it's true. And I think a lot of guys like in the era where I came up with like didn't make it when they were pretty good physical rat style players in the college hockey or in juniors because when they got to the pros they couldn't play that way you know and if they did they would have to be ready to drop the gloves you know 15 times a year 20 times a year and it's not an easy thing to do when you're fighting you know obviously guys who are legitimate tough guys you know so you know I I, I like it I think it, it helped me out for sure just having that type of you know protection and and guys on the ice that can you know, answer the bell, or I knew, you know, I was a little more protected, I would say, as a smaller player when you had guys, you know, able to fight. Well, that brings up an interesting aspect, too, because you've got guys that are essentially in the NHL to be an enforcer, right? So so you got guys that may have not have made it, so they're now they're, they're making their money. You're able to make your money because you're being protected. I'm curious on – the other side of it, of, of how this is going to affect the financial aspect of the queue now, because, you know, people want to see that. Yeah. I mean, I think when you're even down here, like you go to the Everblaze games, like probably the, the loudest the crowd gets is when there's a scrap going on or yeah. and things like that. And, you know, as crazy as it sounds, it's it's uh, I think it's it's part of the game. And I wonder I wonder what the implications will be in the queue as well. Like, you know. You know, there's there's both sides to it too. There were there were players getting into the league that couldn't skate at all and were just fighters. And I don't think there's a place for that either. Right. You know, I think you have to the modern day um, tough guy is someone who can you know play can play on the third and fourth line, chip in, but also you know protect the teammates when he needs to and offer that 
that that toughness when the team needs it. So, you know, it's interesting though. It's definitely an interesting uh, turn, but everything's going a little bit more protected, you know, just with how everything's going kind of in, in sports. Well, that's true. And we're seeing that now, um, that recent incident with Adam Johnson over in, yeah. in England. So, um, for those of you that don't know, Adam Johnson was a former NHL player playing over in uh, Pro League in England and a couple months ago took a skate to the throat and yeah. actually ended up passing away from it. Yep. Uh, the gentleman who, who hit him, whether it be voluntary, involuntary, there's kind of kind of out there, has now been arrested and charged. And I'm not sure if they're charging him with homicide or attempted or whatever it may be but they're they're yeah. charging them with it and it just kind of creates that slippery slope because how do you define intent yeah. um what, what yeah, are your thoughts i on didn't that? see I, mean, I didn't see it um i never saw the actual clip of it and so it's hard it's hard to it looks like he tried to kick him but obviously not you kick him in the throat to, you have it's, to watch the clip ryan because it's such it's not your typical body reaction like he got hit from someone else and his he was parallel, but he also knew someone was going by. So it was like someone's going by and you do this last second to try and trip. And it was just a perfect storm. And yeah, yeah, oh, it's terrible. It's yeah. scary. It's terrible. Like I have, a, you know, I coach a 10 U team for the Florida junior Everglades. Yeah. You know, my son plays like it's, that's a scary thing, you know? So everyone's wearing neck guards now. Thank goodness. USA hockey made the rule. Um, which is a smart one. Doesn't take away from anything to throw the neck guard on. Yeah. You yeah. have to, or is it optional? I have to. <coughs> I just realized that Matt Petgrave, the one who <coughs> did get arrested, uh, actually did play for the Everblades a couple of years ago. Okay, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I didn't didn't know that. No shit, he played here in Florida. Yeah, wow. twenty one to twenty two. So he's locked up right now. As far as I know, yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. We're gonna have to look into that. Yeah, it's kind of kind of a weird situation. Yeah. I, I am curious though on the business side of things when you when you went into the NHL you said you had an agent can you kind of unpack to us how you went about um, going after an agent because there's obviously a lot of bias if guys are reaching out to you you're like well of course you're reaching out to me because you want to get your hands in the cookie jar how did what can you unpack what that process looked like in interviewing and finally selecting your agent yeah um, for me I was like as we said an undersized guy so I wasn't a big prospect. Like, I had a long road to the NHL. So I don't think any, you know, I didn't have agents lined up at, yeah. this, at that time period for the smaller player. Like, it wasn't like, hey, this guy's going to make it. Yeah, I don't think anyone thought I would ever make it. So there was a guy, uh, Cornerstone Management, Steve Mountain. Um, he represented a bunch of guys, you know, famous guys, Ron Hextall, Scott Mellon. Hextall the hacker. You know, guys like, guys the Philly area. He had a lot of guys in Philly. He had Jameer Nelson, uh, college basketball player of the year, Orlando Magic All-Star. He had, uh, he worked with Stephen A. Smith for a while. Like, so he was doing a lot of different um, hockey, basketball, TV personalities. And he was just a very, very smart guy and great mentor and, you know, I met with him, my dad was with me, and we both left the meeting, and he was just very honest. And this is the same thing I liked about Mike Schaefer at Cornell, the head coach at Cornell. Like, they didn't promise anything, and that just really resonated with me. They were just like, you know, Schaefer was like, I'm not going to promise you you're going to play, you know, top two lines or anything. You're, you're going to get a chance to play, and it's up to you. That's it. Like, that's all he <laughs> promised me, you know, where other coaches and other people recruit me were like, I have you at – starting, you know, second line center, second power play, like right off the bat. And I just felt like there was something really honest about that. Steve Mountain said the same thing when we were talking. It was just that, uh, you know, you're, the market's going to tell you how good you, you know, how much money you're going to make and how good you are. We're going to push that market when the, when the time is right. But you have to, you know, produce and it's going to take a body of work over a period of time for you as a smaller player to, you know, finally get the recognition. And he was dead on. And, and it took me... You know, I broke in the NHL at 28, and it took that long of leading teams and scoring and, you know, putting up points finally to kind of change minds and get over the hump. So, you know, that interview process was was simple. We left that meeting. My dad and I said, I like that guy. He's very honest, straightforward. You know, he said, your first contract doesn't mean anything. We're playing for the second one. First contract is get a good opportunity. Don't worry about the money. And then do something with it, and then we'll, we'll start. So he goes yeah. to market, and yeah. – and, and and he's starting with the NHL teams, AHL teams, each like where 
Yeah, for me... Where's the portal to put your name in the hat? Yeah, I mean, for me, he's calling general managers of NHL teams uh, or assistant general managers of NHL teams, which usually run the American League team, um, and trying to find the right fit where you're needed and wanted. And that's kind of the things he always talked about. Try to go where you're needed and wanted. Uh, not one or the other. So you weren't like one of these modern guys that, oh, I'm not playing in Boston. I'm not playing. No. In- <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't. You, you were going to play anyway. play anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Anyone that was going to give me a good opportunity to play or a chance, you know, I was going to, you know, try to do that. As you go in your career, obviously, as you have a body of work and a resume and stats, then the negotiations, you know, come, you know, later, like after my, you know, getting into Russia, after my first year in Russia, having, you know, great numbers, that's where you have leverage, right, to start to try to push the contracts. I don't understand because I see a lot of these new prospects, and I think it would be a good segue into the, the All Ivy Showcase is I see some of these prospects now that they're they're super, like they're the next coming, and they're actually calling their shots now saying, I don't want to play here, I don't play here. But hearing your story, I mean, you're one shift away from ending your fucking career. I yeah. mean, do you think it's short-sighted for some of these guys too? It's hard to say. I mean, you know, you don't know all the information either. You don't know what's going on, you know, behind closed doors. Maybe someone drafted him that's no longer there. Now they're not having the same feeling about them. These are guys who are top picks. I was a no pick, you know. So it's different, different story, right? Um, Eric Lindros did it. You remember he wouldn't yeah. he wouldn't play in uh, Quebec, Quebec, I think it was, yep. and you know turned out you know great. I mean he was. Not a lot of people even remember that who don't know that story. He know? was the second coming at that time, too. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, everyone's different. Their, their agents, you know, probably know something that we don't know and try to put them in the best possible situation. You, you ever th- you ever get a Gordie Howe hat trick? Uh, no. I, I don't think I got – I only had five career fights, and I don't think – I had a goal and an assist at any of those games. So. We might have to look that up. <laughs> I'm, we'll pr- I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure I'd say I don't. I probably wouldn't remember that if I did. What yeah. was the toughest fight? My fights were all quick. They were very quick. <laughs> Cat fights? Yeah. yeah they, were usually, <laughs> usually, they, were, they would always be like, it was never like a staged face-off square up. It would be something happened in the game, and then I, I would be pissed or, you know, something happened. Then all of a sudden you just start, like, fighting just out of more emotion. That was more... My style. A lot of guys wouldn't fight me because, you know, there's a couple of reasons. I think I played a pretty like stiff game. I like reversed hit a lot and was physical for my size. So people didn't really know. They like didn't know this guy may be tough and like, I don't know. Sleeper. And so you don't really want to get embarrassed, especially by a guy who's like smaller, you know, much smaller than you. And get, You're right. You get the underdog. So, like, yeah. There's that component. And then also if they did tune me up then they'd have to fight like the rest of the team so it's kind of i was in a good situation better situation than you would think for a small guy like you know usually it'd be like oh you're you know you have to drop drop the gloves i would say like a middleweight has more of a chance of like getting hurt in like that situation than someone who's small because i had those kind of things working for me that's cool let's talk about um we use the podcast here as a vehicle to not only push out our brand keep us relevant but also there's a component um speaking of neurological, that you're six times more likely to have a cons- customer buy from you if they like you. Now, we can't control if they like us, but we can't control if they're likable. And so by bringing on other guests and exposing other things in the area kind of makes us relevant. But I want to get into the um, Ivy Showcase. Yeah. And, and what is it and why did it start? Why yeah. are you doing it? Yeah, so when we started Matterhorn Fit, our rehab and training centers, we were attracting... A lot of athletes as well as, you know, active seniors and older people. But, you know, we're also attracting a lot of hockey players, you know, just by our background. And so when we were having conversations with these parents about helping their kids get to the next level, there was very little thought about what school they were going to. It was just like, get my kid to D1. I've spent so much time and energy and money in this sport. Like, I don't even care anymore. Just get this kid to D1. And after having continuous conversations uh, about that, it became evident that the focus of like youth hockey was completely backwards. Like maybe some of these kids will play in the NHL, maybe most likely not just by the statistics we talked about earlier. So like these kids should be using hockey to get into the best school they can still trying to pursue their dream of making the NHL, but also getting a great education, surrounding themselves with a great network of people. And so we start an event that geared towards all of that. And it's called the Matterhorn fit all Ivy showcase. We do it at Hertz arena 
uh, right here in Southwest Florida. And we bring in 216 of the top Division One prospects from all over the world. Last two years, we had the Slovakian national team playing it. Um, and we bring in all the Ivy League hockey schools, which is Cornell, Brown, Princeton, Dartmouth, Yale, um, and Harvard. And then we have other schools coming. We have Boston College, Penn State, UNH, Maine, Northeastern, Man. Um, AIC. Anybody um, who's relevant. Yeah, so we have some some big times, and it's time during the NCAA Coaches Convention. So we have all the NCAA coaches down in Naples at the time of the event. Many of them will end up coming over and recruiting out of the event, and we, we get a ton of um, commitments out of there every year. A ton of the players that are in the event end up committing Division One. And so we center the whole event around information. We do a lot of, you know, crazy stuff. We have, you know, fly in the Cornell pep band. We have a 450-person welcome reception at the Hyatt uh, Coconut Point. We do open bar for the parents, past hors d'oeuvres, live music, um, presentations from the Ivy League schools, presentations from all the non-Ivy schools, and really give people a much deeper understanding of the process, how to, how to get recruited, what the academics are like at these universities and try to put into their heads the goal of whether it's Ivy League or not, doesn't matter. That's just what we use as kind of the messaging, but it's really about getting to a better school than you would have without hockey. And that's really the goal of it. And so we have that event in May. Um, and then we do another one for younger kids, 12 through 14 year olds, where we bring in the Ivy League schools as well as there'll be probably over 20 20 prep schools and academies that come down to Florida and recruit um, to create the pipeline of education and influence those kids the same thing to use hockey as a vehicle to get into the best school they can. That's awesome. Do so, I, any of these kids end up coming to and working out with you guys? Yeah, yeah. So we we have you know we actually have a lot of number of the kids in this area. Um, we have a lot of high end hockey players in this area and a lot of high end players that move to this area because their parents are, you know, semi retired at places. Once they find out about Matterhorn, um, not only hockey, but this happened in a lot of the other sports as well. Um, it gives them a reason, you know, to come down here and not have to sacrifice one or the other, right? They have great training, they have where their parents are living, they have great, you know, weather, golf, kind of all the, the things. And so, um, yeah. A lot of the players. Would you say that if you had the ability to train like the way you guys are preparing these kids now in Matterhorn before your career started, yeah. that, that you would have ended up in a different place? Yeah, I think it's hard to say because of the, because of the you know, everything's evolved, right? Back then, no one was doing anything. Okay. Yeah, would I have been a much better player? Yes, 100%. Would I have been healthier? 100%. I mean, but not everybody's training the way you guys... I've been kind of on this little circuit and the best shape I was ever in in my life last year was when I was working at Matterhorn. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say that one. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, what we were doing is a whole nother level beyond what has previous been the highest level of, uh, neurological rehab and, and getting your body to work and strength and conditioning. Um, because we fully integrate that whole process because it's one process and how we seamlessly integrate, integrate, what's going on neurologically uh, that is causing uh, pain or movement dysfunction and how we reinforce that and um, provide not only ultimate healing but uh, advancement in performance is something no one's, re no one's doing and it's something that uh, we pride ourselves on, that secret sauce, you know, and how we execute that. But if so. a top prospect decided to, to join and, and go through that regiment, not only are they going to be their body, which is their number one tool, is going to be in better shape. But then they also have access to you of experience, maybe p potentially financial literacy or just to you've been there. It's yeah. not like you're telling them something and you've never been. You know, yeah. my grandfather used to say, never take advice from someone you wouldn't trade places with. You were in the fucking NHL. Yeah. And so if their dream is to be in the NHL and they need strength coach, who would be a better fit than someone like you? Yeah, and, and my partner, Sean Sullivan. Right. Yeah. And Sean <clears throat> trained professional athletes for nine years before we started Matterhorn. Shout out Sully. Exclusively, he was training pros. And so, you know, he's worked with, you know, over 100 professional athletes, 11 Olympians now. And it's, it's you know, he knows exactly from the strength and conditioning side how to, how to enhance performance, you know, unlike anyone I've ever seen. So Bryce and I, just quick story, Bryce and I were about three months into Matterhorn. And now we're getting a little cocky, you know. You know how we are. And we're competing, and we asked the trainer, their coach, to 
listen, we want you to dial us up like we're one of the NHL guys that's coming here. Let's put us through that workout. <laughs> 20 minutes into this, Bryce and I were throwing up out back, and we ended up having to get on our backs and put our feet above our head because we were both on the – we. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't even close to where we thought we would be yeah. at. And it was a quick realization that this this business can cater to anybody. If you want to get pushed, they will push you. Yeah. And, you know, that's kind of we have, you know, people of all, from the high level athletes to, you know, 80 years old working out, you know, with us. And um, it's really that customized approach that what is what makes it special. You know, you're not going to a gym and there's a workout on the board and you're just running through that workout no matter who you are. Everything is seamlessly designed based on what the rehab uh, showed us and the data we collect to build that program and progress that program over time. You know, these guys were uh, getting a little too cocky. So, uh, oh, yeah, Sh we Sean, were humbled. Sean, Sean had to put them in, in, in the place to make sure, uh, you know, they Sound, sounds sounds like we right. got to give them the gas. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we could have used the gas. <laughs> we could have used the gas. Well, this is really fascinating. So, uh, any charities in particular that Matterhorn or you guys? Um, uh, like to speak about or any shout outs anything any questions you have for us uh you know for you guys i think just uh love to keep you know s seeing your progress it's awesome to see your growth as well uh, especially in this area and out of this area and having to you know go through the the process with you of just actually getting uh custom glass work done uh you know it, again it was seamless it was easy and you know i think that a lot of people may see the social media and not really understand the depths of what's behind it and how um, how committed the team is. You know, it's not like either you guys were there. Your whole team was phenomenal, the guys who came in. So, um, yeah, hopefully you guys continue your success as well. We, we appreciate that. We really – that means a lot, actually. And we're anxious to be a part of the All Ivy Showcase with the uh, kind of glass breaking challenge. Yeah, we'll, we'll introduce something special for yeah. everyone. That's right. I like that. I like that. Well, again, Ryan, we really appreciate your time and the stories you shared with us. And we're excited to see um, you. Any big plans for the business that you can unfold? Not yet. Yeah. So we, uh, you know, we launched our franchise system um, six weeks ago. Uh, we have a number in the pipeline. We're going to be opening up locations, uh, hopefully um, close to this area as well as outside of this area, pretty soon. Are you guys looking for operators? Uh, we we have the ideal operator is a strength and conditioning coach, a PT or a business owner or an ex-athlete who has that kind of mindset. We have a very special culture at Matterhorn. And, you know, for us, for people to get through the process, um, especially early on to open up uh, some of our initial, to be our initial franchise partners, um, it has to resonate with us on a cultural level uh, more, as much as anything else. So um, those would be the types of people we're, we're continuing to look for. And fortunately enough, we've had a great start uh, to it. And you know, hopefully we'll have some announcements here in the in the very near future. If anybody cool. saw this and was interested, how could they get a hold of you? Yeah, if you go on MatterhornFitFranchise.com, uh, you'll be able to request some information, um, and then you'll get an email overview of the opportunity and be able to book a call with us uh, to uh, schedule and to start the process. Um, we take we take our time with it. We make sure it's a right fit, and uh, you know we have something very special, and we want to make sure that we continue to. Uh, have the, the the right partners in place to help scale the brand. We appreciate it, Ryan. Uh, thank you for Thanks, your time. Uh, yeah. thank best you. of luck. That's great. I'm 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 really looking forward to watching this franchise thing grow. We've had a lot of discussions about that internally, and I'm anxious to unpack that in a year from now. But I I'd be happy to vouch the culture. I've been to both their locations in Naples and Benita. They're phenomenal. The culture's phenomenal. Cleanliness. They obviously just remodeled. They have some of the nicest glass. So I would encourage anybody to reach out to Ryan or Sully should they have any um, interest in opening a franchise and or coming in to just get in shape. You want to get your ass kicked? Come come look up Matterhorn. And by the way, uh, Matterhorn, the Peaks, great, yeah. trendy, clean logo. Yeah. Any, I mean, have you yeah, ever climbed so, the Matterhorn? Yeah, so the, you know, my last two years were in Switzerland and uh, the Matterhorn is a near symmetrical peak. So it represents the three parts of our process, the neurological diagnostics, the advanced rehabilitation and then the performance training. And so that's where that name and, and brand come in. And, you know, we're helping people with all people in pain. Uh, that's really the starting place. People are in pain and uh, there's not a great solution out there. So um, if people are with no medicine, that's you know, what this I is love. Non-invasive, non-surgical. 
Uh, we averaged two weeks. Uh, over 94% of the people we've seen have had a major reduction of pain within two weeks. And I am in the 100 Club, just so if you go there, you'll know <laughs> what that means. And it's not easy to get there. <laughs> but it's fucking awesome. <laughs> awesome. All right, thanks, Ryan. All we right. appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.